Thank you to the organizers for uh, having such an interesting conference. I've learned a lot, um, and it's been a delight to be here. Um, so thank you. Um, this title, it's such a catch-all that, I mean, because basically everybody everywhere who works on gravitational wave science works in some, at some level at improving the sensitivity of the interferometers. So this is kind of just like a title, science, but whatever. Um, and really, maybe I should have renamed it just musings and thinking about how, how do we use big data, data in a big way um, to work on the interferometers themselves. So this will be from the perspective of an instrumentalist. I um, dabble in software stuff, and, but it's always to very directly come back to some hardware thing. So not that you can tell, but this is me like a week ago. Um, and what we're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis right now is um, we are reinstalling a bunch of new hardware into the interferometers at both of the LIGO observatories in preparation for commissioning for uh, the fourth observing run. Uh, and one of the big upgrades is we will have a new laser. Uh, we will double our laser power from 03 to 04, um, which should hopefully significantly increase our, our high frequency sensitivity. So somebody has to build the laser. Um, and the work is being led by one of our engineers, um, but I'm in there almost every day working on it. So this is very much the perspective of somebody who is a hardware person and not on a day-to-day -day basis a software person. Um, and I guess I say that because the gravitational wave data does have to come from somewhere, and that somewhere is hardware at some level, right? So we think a lot about H of T. Um, but that's not quite the same language that we think of it in the actual detector. We think more about the meters of mirror motion than the true gravitational wave strain. So it's just a little bit of a different language. So it's useful, I think, sometimes to kind of come back and think about the context of where did all of this data come from. Uh, that said, there are lots of opportunities to apply big data techniques to the gravitational wave detectors to help improve them. Um, and something that my good friend Michael said was, you know, which I a little bit take issue with, was that that part was done. Um, and it's all, it's all false. Um, there's always more to do, um, which is true of any kind of science, and that's what we do, right? We, we push boundaries, but certainly also in the hardware realm um, and improving the instrument itself realm, there's a lot more to do. Uh, and we've heard from Gabby the other day, we heard from Guillermo just before this, we'll hear also from Jess and Gabriele tomorrow, um, other ways of directly using big data techniques to uh, look at and improve the interferometers. So I will specifically not talk about the things that they're talking about just because they'll, they'll cover those topics so, so thoroughly. Um, this is where I work and live. Um, so this is the instrument hall at the LIGO Hanford Observatory. We saw a nice CAD drawing, CAD representation of it um, in Guillermo's talk. Um, but we actually sit, like really on the other side of this wall is the control room and that's where most of the observatory staff really spend our day-to-day -day time. Uh, and this really is a gravitational wave interferometer, I promise. Um, the laser room where we're building the laser comes from this wall. We've got our main beam splitter. Um, Obviously, all sorts of other things, but then the beams go out, they pierce the wall, and they go down their four kilometer path to the end stations, to the other building back. And then eventually, after the beams have recombined, our gravitational wave photo detectors are kind of in this corner of the instrument hall. Um, this is an hour, hour in the life of Jenny. Um, this is some years ago, but this is us bringing the interferometer online. Uh, this is our control room. And in particular, the top center plot is the strain um, sensitivity to gravitational waves. It is the front and center plot because it's obviously the most important. And you can see there is no red live trace right now. These are just our kind of fiducial traces. And as we increase our laser power, as we actually have beam on the gravitational wave photo detectors at the gravitational wave detection port, um, we start to see the red trace come in to uh, sensitivity. Um, 
and we do all of our final tunings. Once we've got the mirrors under control, then we have to tune them to bring them to their most sensitive operating point. And finally, we have something that matches roughly our fiducial uh, gravitational wave sensitivity from whatever that was. Uh, this is an older video, so I believe it's actually O2 that this is from. And then the last little bit is just checking all of the little boxes and ensuring all of the things are kind of ready so that we can hit the yes, we're observing for gravitational waves button. Um, and at the end of this hour, we then hit the, we're gonna start observing. Um, and then we listened for gravitational waves for the rest of whatever day that was. Uh, and I show this one because it's kind of cool and, you know, I don't know, I like this video. Uh, but also to emphasize that there are lots of kinds of data that we are looking at uh, throughout the whole process of bringing the interferometer online um, and getting it to its most sensitive operating point. We have um, environmental sensors kind of cut off here. Guillermo was telling us about some of the environmental sensors that exist around site. So we monitor those um, all of the time. We monitor kind of in these side TVs and underneath TVs, what is the current state of various subsystems of the interferometer. Um, as well as we can pull up any number of channels if there's something that we want to look at kind of in the moment that we don't normally have on the TVs. We also have two walls of TVs to our sides. Um, then we can also pull them up on our workstations. So there's an enormous amount of data that goes into the just kind of day-to-day -day operation of the interferometer. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about is how do we control the interferometer? Like how do we actually know what to do um, in order to make the laser resonate in these four kilometer arm cavities uh, so that we have a gravitational wave detector? So there are lots of things that we control. Um, most importantly is the distance between the mirrors Obviously, to have a resonant laser cavity, we need all of our mirrors to be an integer number of half wavelengths apart. Um, where that gets complicated is that that has to be true for all of these sets of mirrors, not just any pair, but all of them together need to be within range. We also have to control the angle of the mirrors. This is four kilometers, so a small misalignment on one of our end mirrors means that the return beam will no longer be pointed back at uh, the main beam splitter. The other things that we need to control, um, the laser is our ruler that we're using to determine how are the mirrors moving, and then the mirrors are our test masses in space time. So we need to make sure that our ruler is very, very truly stable. And so we also need to control things like the laser frequency, the laser intensity, in order to have the best possible ruler to be measuring the, the changes in space time. Each of these mirrors is, of course, not at all like a simple little cartoon. Um, each of them, our main mirrors, are quadruple pendula. So these are... Uh, vertical isolation springs, and then it's a pendulum, and from that hangs another pendulum, and from that hangs a pendulum, and then from that, using uh, the glass fibers, hangs our final stage of pendula. And we heard from Gabby uh, on Monday, maybe, about the glass rings, the, the gold rings on the reaction chain glass, and so that's represented by this is actually eight pendula because it is two quadruple pendula right next to each other. And we need to control every angle. So each one, each piece of this has six degrees of freedom. It's got translational and rotational degrees of freedom. So we have to control all of that. And we have to control where is it relative to every other one in the interferometer. These don't live in isolation, however. They live inside of our vacuum chambers. Um, so this is kind of a zoom in. So this is actually the floor. 
And effectively, between the floor and the top of the mirror is another three layer of active pendula. So in total, we have seven layers of pendula um, isolating between the true ground and the mirror itself where the laser hits. And the scale of these is, they're pretty big. So this is again me. Um, so that's, I'm, I'm this tall. And that's me standing next to one of our input test masses uh, some number of years ago. Uh, so you can tell that they're really quite enormous systems with a lot of moment of inertia. So you have to kind of figure out how are we going to push on them and actuate them to do what we want them to do. So in order to actually achieve all of this, to control all of these things and more, we have several hundred simultaneous control loops. Each one of these needs to be operating precisely at its design point in order to not be re-injecting noise into the gravitational wave strain. So we have to have all of these loops operating just how we design them in order to have the gravitational wave interferometer actually function. Um, and these control loops, some of them, the bandwidth of the loop is kind of how fast are we actuating, how fast are we reacting to a change. Some of them for the seismic systems, um, particularly kind of the first three layers of isolation, uh, we only actuate kind of once every 100 seconds or so, very slow. Others, the laser frequency, we operate at kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz, because that we need to control the laser frequency very, very precisely across all frequency bands so that in our gravitational wave band, it's really stable. So that one we control very, very strongly up to very high frequencies. Um, but, so we have to have all of the control systems operating exactly as we design them to, but we are not yet perfect at designing those control loops. So this is a very busy plot, and for that I apologize. Um, but the x-axis is frequency, the y-axis is displacement. Um, as an instrumentalist, I prefer meters to strain, so if one divided this by 3995 meters, then you get the gravitational wave strain. Uh, the black dotted trace is the design sensitivity of the advanced LIGO interferometers. The black kind of more solid trace is the measured sensitivity at whatever time this was. Uh, the discrepancy here at high frequencies must just be that we didn't have the quantum squeezer uh, enabled. So that, that is not such a big worry. At low frequency here though, there's a gigantic discrepancy between the dotted design sensitivity curve and the actual measured curve. And a lot of that comes from the control noise um, that we'll talk about in just a moment here. So I show this just to say that a lot of this noise at low frequency we can explain, but we don't yet have a good way to get rid of it. And so that's something that we need to work on and I hope that we can leverage uh, computer-aided design type techniques, machine learning type techniques, to help us figure out how to do this a little bit better. So this is also a very busy plot. Um, this is a way that we look at um, the control system. So the x-axis is once again in frequency, the two panels, the top plot is magnitude and the bottom is phase because um, our actions all have some complex value. But first I'll just talk about the magnitude. This is basically saying if I move, if I saw that my mirror moved by some amount, what am I going to do about it to hold it still? What kind of force do I need to apply to hold that mirror still? And I make that decision as a function of frequency. So at lower frequencies, I need to hold harder. I need to hold onto the mirror more strongly. But our mirrors are, of course, way more complicated than just a single pendulum. Uh, this system that I happen to have 
up plot four is actually one of our auxiliary cavities. So this is for the signal extraction cavity where um, it's actually just a three mirror pendulum. So I only show mirror one, two, and three, or mass one, two, and three. But we need to decide also, in addition to just overall, what are we going to do if the bottom mass where the laser is reflecting off of, if that moves, we also need to decide how much should we push where. And it turns out that we would like to push very, very little, as little as possible on the most bottom stage because this is where we need to hold it still. And it happens to be true that uh, if I were to instead push up one stage, then any kind of mistakes almost I make, they will get filtered out by the natural pendulum resonance. So it's kind of okay to push a little harder but more imprecisely at up higher and higher stages. And so um, in this magnitude plot, I've got the total, but I've also got the amount that I'm pushing on each of the individual stages. And it happens that the bottom stage, I'm pushing the hardest. The middle stage pushes, dominates, and pushes the hardest in the middle region. And the lower stage is the one that's getting pushed hardest at the high frequencies because due to that natural pendulum resonance, you can't really push at very high frequencies on the upper stages. The thing that's tricky about this is that um, a control system will have a one over one plus in its, just in the way that you write down what a control system does which means that were you ever to push with a force of minus one in magnitude, then you'd have an unstable system. Then you'd be trying to push one over one minus one. That's not really a number that we can push like an actual force of. So that's where this phase plot comes into play, is that we must ensure that never do we have the phase equal to 180 degrees at the same frequency that we have the magnitude uh, zero decibels, so magnitude of one, magnitude of unity. And that has to also be true for the way that each stage crosses over. If we try to push the top stage left with one unit force and this stage right with one unit force, then they'll start to just oscillate bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we'll have ourselves a problem. So we need to be able to design this kind of a control loop, which is actually not such a simple loop because it has to also include the dynamics of this physical pendulum system in such a way that it will hold the mirror still, but not have any uh, one over zero infinities in the system. Uh, ah. So one big thing that it causes that like restriction that we can't have one over zero um, is that we cannot infinitely quickly roll off the magnitude. It turns out in these control systems in a causal system that if you want to make the magnitude go down, the phase will also go down. And so I can't have this kind of be pushing at 99 hertz and then suddenly not pushing at 100 hertz. That's not something that I can implement physically uh, without having some very, very fast phase, phase decay. And that is a problem because we wish that we could push really hard in regions where we want and not so hard in regions where we don't want. So this is a plot of that same system as a function of frequency, how much is the mirror moving? Uh, and the actual motion of the mirror is this yellow-orange curve. So it's kind of 10 to the minus 11 meters per root hertz-ish, or meters, kind of RMS-ish, somewhere in here. Um, but our, this is our ability to measure with the laser in hitting a photodiode what's going on. 
But our laser system can't actually measure perfectly at all frequencies. At some point, we run into analog electronics noise and also shot noise, uh, statistics counting noise of the actual photons hitting the photodetector. So we can't measure at these frequencies with this particular system better. So we think the true motion is probably lower at these frequencies, but we can't measure it better than this. But since our control loop isn't able to differentiate as a function of frequency the true motion um, and then suddenly stop pushing, stop actuating at this noise place, we end up injecting some of this noise into the gravitational wave system. So this is analog electronics noise or shot noise or some other kind of noise that we wish we didn't push on the mirror, but we en often end up needing to in order to satisfy the causality requirements for our, and stability requirements for our control system. It turns out if you know what your uh, control system looks like as a function of frequency, you can also infer what would the motion have been if there was no control system in place. And so that's what um, the green curve is showing, is uh, if I had not been pushing on the mirror, it would actually have been moving kind of 10 to the minus 7 range in meters. Um, ah, and the blue line, which is underneath the green line, and then kind of here, and then comes down, this is how much I'm pushing on the mirror to hold it still. In order to make this change from what it would have moved to what it's actually moving, I had to push on the mirror. And the amount I'm pushing on the mirror is this blue trace, which you can see doesn't uh, instantly go to zero. So this is a criteria that I need to make sure that I think about as I'm designing my control loop. Yeah. Could, if we could measure it better, so that um, in that region where it's blue and going down, then that blue signal would be useful, I guess. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely true. If we had the ability to lower this analog electronics noise, then we would be able to measure real motion down to a higher frequency more precisely. And the final gravitational wave photodetectors are more sensitive than these others. Um, but there's a lot of hardware and infrastructure that has to go into that. And it's so far not really feasible to do that in every single place. Right, so lowering that thing is not trivial. <laughs> no, not at all trivial. Um, partly because this is often, we want these to be quantum shot noise limited. And so if we're allowing more photons to this place, that means that we are actively making the choice to not be allowing photons to go to our final gravitational wave detector, um, which that one we care about more, as it turns out. Uh, so, but yes, there's, there's some cost benefit in also just choosing what kind of um, sensors we use, absolutely. So we have then a lot of criteria for a control system. We need to hold the mirror still, um, but we want to minimize the amount that we contaminate other control loops. Uh, we actually also need to make sure that we are not saturating our actuators. So that's another thing, another piece that we have to put into our cost function is if we run out of range, if we're just pushing as hard as we can, then that leaves us no ability to, to react to anything. And we also need to be robust against some changes. So we've said that we can't have a one over zero situation because that's infinity. But um, if, for example, the temperature in the room changes and then the mechanical properties of the pendula change a little bit, uh, that will change the, the physical uh, mechanics of the pendulum. And we need to be able to handle that. We need to, no matter what the temperature in the room is, we need to not have a one over zero infinity situation. And um, it must be causal. So we have to be able to implement it in our real time system. We can't use future information to decide because we don't have that future information. We need to know just from the past what's going on. So something that I've done a little bit in the past um, 
but would love it if folks wanted to come work on it more is how can we tell a computer these things? And then how can we tell a computer, please design me a control system like that blue magnitude and phase plot we were looking at that satisfies all of these criterion? And that is something that so far is not so easy that we've figured out. Um, because I showed you one control system plot, but we right now have to hand tune, hand design that for hundreds of systems. And as we're putting in new infrastructure for our new quantum squeezer in preparation for 04, we have another set of tens of control systems that we will have to hand design and tune. And wouldn't it be nice if we could say, dear computer, this is just like all of the other things that we've showed you. Give me the answer. Yeah. Could you say more about this? This often not tolerate solutions from optimal controls method. I know you talked a little bit about it, but like explain what that would look like. Like this limit instability. What what do they? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, I guess I've stolen these slides from other talks, and maybe they're a little bit out of order from the original. But yes, um, so there is, in fact, a whole R&D field of how do we do optimal controls? How do we satisfy all of these kinds of criterion? But um, very often they live in a theoretical world where your mechanical system is not changing. And that's not a world that our interferometers live in. So this is a design, um, Hong Yu is now a postdoc at Caltech, but um, while he was a PhD student at MIT, he joined us at the Hanford Observatory for probably more than a year um, to work on a myriad of things, but including can we optimize and automate our controls design. So these are images that I have shamelessly stolen from Hong's thesis, sorry Hong, um, where he's showing a different subsystem, but overall philosophically a similar control loop. Uh, and in black, this is what we have designed by hand to try and do the best that we could by hand. Um, and over here I'm showing, or well, he's showing whatever. Uh, this is, we need the noise from the analog electronics noise to be less than this red curve, if at all possible. And with the black current design, the magnitude we're using still that kind of noise region and pushing on it a little bit. So it ends up that that's this purplish dotted curve where in fact we end up pushing noise above the desired red curve. So Hong used uh, the H infinity formalism which comes out of this optimal control design um, section of mostly electrical engineering as it turns out. And the result for this red design of a control system does in fact succeed in not applying force, not actuating any of that control noise above the desired red curve. So that's really good. Um, and he's made sacrifices. If you see at low frequency, this is a little bit higher than it is in the former plot. So this is the current design and this is the H infinity design. So in order to achieve this, he's had to sacrifice mirror motion at low frequency. But it turns out that this is still within the requirement. Um, the requirement of mirror motion is that it needs to be less than 10 to the minus nine radians. And so even though this is a little bit higher than the hand designed version, it does still satisfy that requirement of not um, changing the angle of the mirror too much. So that's fantastic and it, and it does work and it's actually great. Um, the challenge is that the region is a function of frequency that the curve is staying kind of away from minus one Array away from negative one in the phase space is much, much smaller. So the black curve, the current hand design, if we put our 
unity magnitude somewhere in the middle of this region, then if things change, we've got some elbow room to go back and forth, and we're not going to hit negative one. These um, formalisms don't really have a way to insert that criterion in. It can handle basically all of the other criteria, but not the make it robust so that we never have a one over zero situation. And you can see that this red curve hits zero much, much sooner. So if we're kind of trying to keep our unity magnitude place right around three hertz, uh, one way would be fine, but the other way we would hit a one over zero situation pretty quickly. So this system, while it actually works quite well, it's not flexible in terms of what if things go wrong. And that's something that is instrumentalist makes us very nervous to install and have actually running in our online system. So basically my, my dream goal is that we can someday you leverage this kind of formalism or something similar and design control systems that meet all of the criterion on the former page, including um, the not hitting a one over zero type um, space. And just as kind of an advertisement, if somebody is excited about doing that, um, that's fantastic and wonderful. Um, and my PhD advisor, Rana, uh, has put together, just totally open on GitHub, uh, a set of data that one can use to try and do some things, play with things. So um, anyone is, is always invited to download data whether or not they're within the LIGO collaboration and play with this and hopefully then come contact us and let us know if you've got some neat idea and then we can try and work with you on it because um, that would be really fabulous. So that's what I had to say about control systems and now I'm going to shift to a completely different set of things um, and talk briefly about Newtonian gravitational noise um, which is another aspect of hardware I guess I think of it as hardware, although a lot of it is software and data related, where there's a lot that needs to kind of come together in terms of data pipelines and data analysis to kind of understand what's going on and figure out a game plan for the future. So this really is just F equals G mm over R squared noise. Um, so my little cartoon is that if you have some mass, there's some gravitational attraction, but if the mass disappears, there's less gravitational attraction, and your mirror on a pendulum has fallen a little bit due to kind of traditional gravity. So we have, we can describe um, the acceleration due to this uh, gravitational force. So we've got some acceleration that we need to figure out what, what is happening as this mass comes and goes. G, boring, very good. Uh, the density of the ground, this is in particular for if there's a seismic wave traveling any kind of perturbation in the ground underneath our mirrors, underneath our test masses. So the density of the thing that's moving, in this case the ground. The displacement of the ground, and what matters most here is the vertical motion. So. Um, if some mass is moving side to side, if everything is isotropic below your ground level, then mass moving side to side, you can't really tell the difference. But if your ground level is changing height, that's displacing air volume with ground volume. And so now you've got a density change. You've got ground concrete or dirt or whatever taking up volume that had been air. So we wanna know how much did your mass move and how far away is it uh, from uh, your actual pendulum test mass that you care about. And then we integrate over everything. So the problem with this Newtonian gravitational noise, it is the green curve in this plot, um, which I have taken from the Cosmic Explorer Horizon study. So this is the same kind of sensitivity plot as a function of frequency on the x-axis, and this one is in actual strain on the y-axis. Um, this blue dotted line is what we think that we can achieve with our current infrastructure in 05. So this is the design sensitivity of Advanced LIGO Plus, which will be uh, 05-ish for us. 
And then they have in this dash trace the cosmic explorer design curve for their first phase, and then in gray, the final, after installing and doing more work, cosmic explorer sensitivity. And you can see that at low frequency, it's pretty nearly limited by this green curve, which represents the uh, sensitivity due to that uh, Newtonian gravitational acceleration. And the scary thing is that this already assumes for Cosmic Explorer and similarly for Einstein Telescope and any other future generation that we have already been able to reduce this curve by at least a factor of 10. Um, in, so without doing anything, if we did nothing, this green curve is actually a factor of 10 higher and can limit or very, very nearly limit the current infrastructure of ground-based detectors. So for future generations of detectors, if we want to do anything useful at these low frequencies, Newtonian gravitational noise is on the list of things that we must attack. And one of the reasons that it's a particular problem is that it's very difficult to engineer away. There are lots of clever people in the world who have designed all sorts of amazing things like our quadruple suspensions, our vacuum envelope, all sorts of things. But Newtonian gravitational force, you can't isolate against it. It's just there. It's F equals GMM over R squared noise. Um, the only thing that you can do is move all masses away from your mirror, and we can't afford a vacuum envelope of that size. Um, because if you start to think about also air currents and the temperature of the air, um, those can be relevant up to hundreds of meters away. And that's just not on the list of things that's happening is a 100 meter scale uh, spherical vacuum envelope around every single mirror. So Newtonian gravitational noise is something that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. So how do we deal with it? What do we do? How do we figure out what on earth is even going on? Uh, this is an overhead view of the Hanford Instrument Hall. And something that we did during the second observing run is that we speckled around uh, single axis seismic sensors, little seismometers, at all of these green points. So this was 30 channels, 30 extra channels of data that we collected for the entirety of O2. Um, and then we also had a tilt meter, so one ground sensor that measures how is the floor tilting. And then uh, also one much more sensitive three axis seismic sensor um, that happens to live here on the floor. So we can uh, either, with just a single tilt meter, infer what the ground motion is and therefore what the Newtonian noise is. We can also, from an array of seismometers, infer what the gravitational noise looks like. Um, we cannot yet uh, use H of T directly to measure the Newtonian gravitational noise because the Newtonian gravitational noise for advanced detectors should touch our sensitivity around between eight and 30 hertz. And our detectors are not sensitive enough at low frequency yet. So what we cannot do is directly correlate this data with H of T and say that we have directly measured Newtonian noise. I am very hopeful in the near future we will be able to, but not yet. From this array of so we have to know also where exactly is each of these seismometers on the floor. But then we have a time series coming in from each one of them. And for any given moment in time, we can choose a frequency that we are interested in. This one happens to be 19.2 uh, hertz. Um, so kind of in that 8 to 30 hertz right in the middle of that band. You can kind of invert the seismic array and try and understand what kind of seismic wave is traveling through your array. This is a wave number map. So these are in units of one over meters on both axes. So the closer to the center the maxima is, is actually faster seismic waves. And we can tell the direction of a seismic wave from the xy coordinate that it's traveling. So one thing that we can do from this is infer what kind of vibrational sources do we have around the observatories that we could be getting rid of. 
um, particularly as we build future generations of detectors, um, what kinds of things should we recommend to LIGO India that they avoid having near their detectors? What kinds of things for ET and CE and others should we say avoid having near your detectors? We can also extract the direction and the speed, yes, the, of the array, and then we can repeat these maps um, for every moment in time. And Michael has done this um, and made a histogram. So this is one of the kinds of things that we can learn from this seismic array. Uh, the x-axis here is the speed in meters per second of seismic waves traveling through our array, and the different colors are different frequencies. Um, and what a big takeaway from this is that there's not really any dispersion. So our kind of the ground underneath the detector is pretty isotropic. It's not doing anything too wild. That means that it should be easy to model the seismic waves um, that are near the current detectors. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to subtract out any Newtonian noise that we see in the future. Um, so one thing that we can also take away from this kind of understanding of our current sites is, do we really need 30 seismometers or can we get away with six? And it turns out that if you make a good choice of where those six are placed, you can choose subsets of seismometers. Um, and there's a lot of work ongoing right now at the Virgo Observatory um, to try and particularly as they have much more sophisticated, just the ground level at the Virgo Observatory is not flat um, because they've made it so that they can actually install their mirrors a lot more conveniently. Um, they have to make more sophisticated choices about where their seismometers go. And so there's a lot of work ongoing uh, doing this kind of work at the Virgo Observatory. Something else that you can do though is you can say, if I kind of say that my one rotation sensor is capable of inferring what the Newtonian gravitational noise is, we can use that as a proxy for Newtonian noise. It's not actually a direct measurement, it's an inference, but it gives us something to compare against. And then we can use um, filtering and the seismometer array data to compare, to subtract, and say how well would we be able to subtract Newtonian gravitational noise from the H of T data. Um, and again, this is work that Michael led. Um, but the original, we say that perhaps our Newtonian gravitational noise looked like this green trace. If we use just a single seismometer, we can do some amount of subtraction, remove what we infer to be Newtonian noise from that. Um, but if we use more sensors, we can actually do more like a factor of 10 subtraction. And this is important because as we saw several slides ago, it will require at least a factor of 10 subtraction to successfully operate uh, future generations of gravitational wave detectors. Something that is of concern is that this is still done with an inference of Newtonian noise, kind of saying, we think that this is what the Newtonian gravitational noise is at our observatory, but it's not a direct measurement. So we look forward to hopefully redoing this kind of array work uh, once the interferometers are more sensitive. So those are kind of my musings on a few different ways that big data is useful for um, kind of the hardware side and making choices about what do we do for the hardware for uh, the interferometers themselves. And I show this mostly just to say that there are a lot of kinds of data out there. Uh, this is actually a plot that we look at quite frequently um, as a function of frequency the sensitivity, uh, what our current measurement of the sensitivity is in red, and then every single known source of noise that we can think of. Some are modeled, some are quantum mechanical, some are Brownian thermal noise, others are measured, um, including um, our control noises that we talked about the first half of the talk. And we add all of those up and we try and say, what do we think that the sensitivity is? should be of the gravitational wave detector right now. And any discrepancies that we find, we can start to identify areas where we can improve things. So not to go into detail about this plot because it's got many, many traces, but just to say that there's an enormous amount of data um, and 
this kind of big data and machine learning is not something that we all do on a day-to-day -day basis in kind of the instrumental hardware land. Um, and so I think that we can really benefit from the techniques that are being developed in, in these kinds of groups. And so I look forward to continuing these conversations in the future. Thank you.